Good afternoon and welcome to the Foundation Fighting Blindness Insights Forum. I'm Chris Adams, the Vice President of Marketing and Communications at the Foundation, and we appreciate you joining us for today's call. Before we get started, I'd like to briefly review a few logistical details for the call. Currently, all participants' lines are in listen mode only with no video. Today's conference is being recorded and is available in closed captioning. To activate the closed captioning, please select the closed captioning option located at the bottom of the Zoom interface. Please note that on today's call, our speakers do have their videos live. However, all their comments will be provided verbally and there are no slides. If you are using a screen reader, please be aware that the controls are at the bottom of the Zoom interface. This control bar may collapse when it is not in use. If you prefer to prevent the controls from auto hiding, go to settings within the Zoom platform, select accessibility, and then select always show meeting controls. It might be helpful to maximize your window and navigate by using the tab key. Additional buttons and settings are available by pressing the alt key. During the call, you may ask questions through the Q&A and chat features and by sending an email to info at fightingblindness.org. We will address questions toward the end of the call during the Q&A session, at which time additional instructions for asking those questions will be provided. I'd like to now turn the call over to Jason Menzo. All right, thank you very much, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jason Menzo, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here with the Foundation Fighting Blindness. I'd like to welcome you all to our quarterly insights forum, which highlights the latest developments here at the Foundation Fighting Blindness and within the broader retinal disease community. We have a great lineup for you today. First, I'm gonna start by highlighting some of our recent activities and events focused on increasing community engagement, fundraising, and public awareness of our mission. I will then hand it over to Peter Ginsberg, who recently joined us as Executive Vice President of Corporate Development and Chief Business Officer here at the Foundation. Peter will provide a brief snapshot of his newly created role, followed by a summary of our financial performance through December 31st, 2020. And then our CEO, Dr. Ben Yerksa, will share some reflections on the importance of our strategic partners and uh, thinking about this as we move forward in 2021. And then we will conclude with an update on our venture philanthropy initiative, the Retinal Degeneration Fund, or the RD Fund as we call it, led by Senior Vice President of Investments and Alliances, Dr. Rusty Kelly. And then following our formal remarks, we will have a question and answer period. And at that time, Chris will repeat the instructions on how to ask questions. And as Chris had mentioned, this call is being closed captioned and a replay and fully accessible transcript will be available on our website in the weeks ahead. If you have any feedback related to our accessibility standards or other suggestions for this call or really for the foundation in general, please reach out to us at the email address info at fightingblindness.org. This year, the foundation is celebrating our 50th anniversary and to recognize this important milestone, we are launching many new initiatives and highlighting the fact that we are truly winning the fight together as one team. You may have noticed that in recent months, we've been using the tagline, together we're winning in our communications. And today I'd like to share some of the additional ways we are honoring and celebrating this legacy of winning over the last 50 years. First off, one of the foundation's most important roles is supporting and educating eye care professionals who are out in the community, diagnosing and managing the care for patients with inherited retinal diseases. Last fall, our professional outreach team hosted several educational webinars. The first was entitled Practical Management of Inherited Retinal Diseases, featuring keynote speaker, Dr. Rachel, Rachel Huckfeld from the Mass Eye and Ear. And that was followed by a panel session on low vision resources and rehabilitation. These courses were very well received and we had nearly 200 eye care professionals that participated live and many more who participated online in the recorded sessions. Though the material is targeted for eye care professionals, the replays are available on the foundation's website for anyone to review. Then in late October, we hosted our fall virtual vision walk. 
As you would imagine, we needed to pivot uh, this due to the ongoing pandemic. So what we did is we merged 15 walks that were scheduled to take place all over the country into one national virtual vision walk. And I was excited because we also had 58 teams that registered and fundraised in areas where we don't typically host a live walk, which was fantastic. In total, we surpassed our fundraising goal and raised more than a million dollars towards our mission. A tremendous effort and accomplishment for a, a truly virtual event. Then in December, we hosted our second Music to, music to Our Eyes live stream, which featured a concert and conversation with a special guest who has a connection to our mission. The purpose of this series is to raise awareness, especially among a new audience who may not be familiar with the foundation. This most recent episode in December featured Cody Lee, a singer songwriter and pianist who rose to fame after winning the 14th season of the reality TV show, America's Got Talent back in 2019. Cody was born with optic nerve hyperplasia, which caused him to become legally blind. And he was also diagnosed with autism at an early age. This special event is also uh, available on demand on our YouTube and Facebook pages. And I encourage you to stay tuned for details about our next episode, which we're planning to air later this spring. Another series of popular events here at the foundation are our national chapter vision seminars, and they're being hosted all virtually as webinars right now. And these webinars are presented free of charge through the support of the Chatlos Foundation and other partners. The most recent webinar was this past Saturday, and we hosted one focused on gene therapy that attracted more than 1,600 registrants. This webinar featured a panel discussion of the many ways gene therapies can be used to address retinal degenerative diseases, as well as the latest updates on gene therapy research and clinical trials. This webinar, which is available on our website for replay, was moderated by our very own Senior Director of Scientific Outreach, Ben Shaverman, with well-respected panelists, including Dr. John Flannery from UC Berkeley and the scientific co-founder of the Dairy Bio, Dr. Shannon Boy of the University of Florida and scientific co-founder of Etsina Therapeutics, and Dr. Pete Admanson, Vice President of Ophthalmology for Janssen Pharmaceuticals. These webinars are hosted by various local Foundation Fighting Blindness chapters. And I wanna remind you that we're very fortunate to have a strong network of more than 40 volunteer-led chapters across the country that host a variety of events critical to our success. And building on that, this year, we plan on investing more time and energy into the success of our existing chapters and grow our chapters, both in terms of the number of active chapters as well as the number of engaged members to each. And this is a really important invest, uh, initiative for us this coming year. In the current world of virtual events, the foundation continues to search for innovative and creative ways for our community to connect. As we look forward to the spring and summer of 2021, the pandemic continues to impact our plans. Our number one priority, of course, is keeping the fighting blindness community healthy and safe. And so we have decided to host all of our signature spring events virtually again this year, including our first ever virtual gala. And I encourage you to please join us for this virtual gala. It's gonna be on Rare Disease Day, which is Sunday, February 28th. And it is called Hope From Home, a united night to save sight. And it's gonna feature a celebrity MC and Saturday Night Live alum, Kevin Nealon. And basically from the comfort of your own home, you can experience a virtual party packed with comedy, inspiration, and a special musical performance, all supporting the Foundation Funding Blindness and our mission. The event will feature entertainment from award-nominated recording artist Lachi, also singer-songwriter uh, Charlie Kramer. We're gonna have a silent auction and a live auction, and the opportunity to interact and move between different party rooms with activities including tastings, music and games, health and wellness, sports and science. This night is gonna be even more special because we will also be announcing and presenting our highest research honor, the Laura Liggett Gund Award. We wanna sincerely thank our chairs, Dr. Alice Cohen and Dr. Jonathan Steinberg and the amazing event committee for putting together an evening that you will not wanna miss. 
All the details for this event are on our website at fightingblindness.org. So as I wrap up today, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to introduce one of our newest team members, Mr. Peter Ginsburg, who joined us last month in a new role called Executive Vice President of Corporate Development and Chief Business Officer. Peter is leading our, our financial plans and strategy, along with driving business transactions, strategic planning, and new activities aimed at creating novel revenue streams across the foundation and our defund. Peter has worked extensively with an ophthalmology inspired by his longtime mentor who has retinitis pigmentosa. I'm very pleased to turn the call over to Peter. Well, thank you, Jason. I really appreciate that. I'm very excited to be part of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. I've spent 25 years in the rare disease field, first on the financial side, where I led investments in promising young companies, but more recently as head of corporate development and strategy for two publicly traded rare disease companies, all along with a keen interest in ophthalmic diseases, as Jason noted. Throughout that time, I experienced how important foundations can be in the development of new treatments and in bringing together key stakeholders, such as patients, clinicians, and companies. The foundation is doing all of these things now, but I look forward to helping accelerate the achievement of our mission through more of those things. So let me start um, by providing a brief summary of our financial position. As a reminder, the foundation operates on a July to June fiscal year. So our 2021 fiscal year will end on June 30th. Our audited financial statements for fiscal 2020 are available on the foundation's website in the about us section under financial reporting. So for the first six months of fiscal 2021, unrestricted revenue was approximately 9.8 million against operating expenses of 6.2 million. We're uh, tracking to our overall budget plan for the fiscal year, and that includes targeted revenue of 21.2 million against operating expenses of 14.5 million, with greater than 70% of those expenses going directly to mission-related efforts. Very importantly, the foundation expects to spend roughly $20 million in this fiscal year alone on research projects that we hope and believe will lead to preventions, treatments, and cures for people affected by retinal degenerative diseases. So in addition to the key fundraising events that Jason mentioned, we work closely with leading and emerging companies in our field that provide financial support for foundation initiatives. These collaborations provide companies with an opportunity to engage with patients, clinicians, other companies, and also experts in our field so we can accelerate retinal disease research. Our corporate partners for 2021 currently include AGTC, the Allergan Foundation, Apellus, Astellus, Biogen, Genentech, Janssen, Mira GTX, Spark, and Two Blind Brothers. We're quite excited about that list of partners and we are uh, working with many new partners uh, going forward as well. I'd like to highlight one of our most important recent sponsorship renewals um, and this is with Amira GTX. So we're very encouraged by the progress made by Amira GTX, which is developing gene therapies for X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, uh, RPE65 deficiency, and achromatopsia in clinical trials. Much of this work is in partnership with Johnson & Johnson. At the American Academy of Ophthalmology annual meeting last November, Amira GTX presented phase 1, 2A clinical data in a small number of XLRP patients indicating that statistically significant vision improvement was seen and that improvement was sustained for one year after treatment. So these are early data, but they're promising and we look forward to this gene therapy's further development. Now these corporate partnerships, they're critical. However, they're only a small part of our overall fundraising efforts. So we, we really rely on individual donations and fundraising events that provide the bulk of the funds we raise each year. We're very grateful for the strong and broad support of our community that you represent. And I'd now like to turn the call over to our CEO, Dr. Ben Yerksa. Ben? Hi, well, thanks, Peter. Uh, it's great to have you on the team. Really, really stoked to have you with us. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us on our quarterly update call. Since we're at the beginning of a new calendar year, I think it's you know a good time to step back and highlight uh, a theme central to accomplishing our mission, and that's essentially teamwork. One of the best ways we can leverage and multiply the impact of the foundation in our communities is by forging partnerships. 
We can accelerate our results by collaborating with peer organizations, community leaders, and other visionaries in the field. As Peter highlighted, corporate partnerships have enabled the foundation to invest in cutting edge science directed towards a variety of promising research opportunities. And we're really grateful for this support. We also have many other types of collaborations. So let me share a few of those. So we work with other organizations and nonprofits to secure research funding for specific conditions and the development of novel treatments. For example, we're partnering with Dr. James Free and his wife, Carol, along with other restricted funds in the, in the Free Family AMD Research Program, which is providing $3 million in funding for new research projects related to the development of therapies for age-related macular degeneration. Sophia Sees Hope has partnered with the foundation to support therapy development and genetic testing. This nonprofit was founded by Laura Manfrey and Charles Preby to generate awareness, raise funds for research, and provide outreach, support, and education for those affected by Libra congenital amaurosis, or LCA, and other inherited retinal diseases. Two Blind Brothers, a mission-driven clothing company founded by Bradford and Brian Manning, donates 100% of profits to fund research through a partnership with the foundation. We have also collaborated with two blind brothers in creating and hosting our Music to Our Eyes series that Jason mentioned. We also partner with medical experts and industry players to generate information relevant to the broad community, such as natural history studies and genetic testing. So for example, we're currently conducting the PRO-EYES study for people with retinitis pigmentosa or RP caused by mutations in the gene EYS. These multi-year studies are really critical to, for understanding the impact any therapy may have on the natural progression of disease. These efforts help accelerate the development of treatments. And the findings from these studies are published widely and widely disseminated so that we can share what we learn with therapy developers from around the world. Our combined goal is to boost and accelerate development for all commercial and academic researchers. These studies require significant investment with more than $5 million required just to run one study. We wanna do more of these studies over time, of course. So this is an area where partners can help accelerate our progress. We have many collaborators supporting the multi-year pro eye study, for example, including the Jabe Center for Health Research, which is a nonprofit clinical research organization, the Duke Reading Center, the KC Reading Center, Blueprint Genetics, Informed DNA, MS, Carrie Branham at the University of Michigan, Stephen Dager at the University of Texas, and Rob Huffnagel at the NIH and the National Eye Institute. We're also partnered with Blueprint Genetics and Informed DNA to offer the My Retina Tracker program, which is an open access, no cost genetic testing program. The genetic testing is provided through Blueprint Genetics, a leader in the field of clinical genetic testing of rare inherited diseases. And then genetic counseling services are provided by Informed DNA, leveraging their full-time staff of lab-independent, board-certified genetic specialists. We're also grateful to receive very generous financial support from the George Gunn Foundation to help run these important programs. Another example is, you know, we, we look for opportunities to partner with organizations that enable us to leverage expertise and education to broaden our scope in an efficient manner. So for example, the foundation is partnered with Fight for Sight to fund grants for veterinary postdoctoral fellows and residents in ophthalmology, particularly those investigating inherited retinal degenerative diseases, as both organizations recognize that eye and vision research often begins with animal studies. We've also kicked off a new partnership late last year with Odelia Therapeutics, which is an independent nonprofit organization whose mission is to move new drug therapies for rare disease from research into the clinic. So we're teaming up with their experts to hold a four-part webinar series on preclinical and translational research. This series focuses on genetic technologies for blinding diseases and provides actionable preclinical development information to researchers looking to advance their ideas into the clinic and help patients. In addition to the partners I've just mentioned, of course, we have many other teammates working towards our mission including our board of directors, scientific advisory board, clinical consortium, the RD fund board, and the foundation staff. We're really honored to work with so many amazing individuals and organizations. As we celebrate our 50th anniversary year, the message 
together we're winning, really captures the essence of our many constituents, including our national organization, the robust scientific community, our chapters, volunteers, and donors, all coming together to fight the diseases that cause blindness. When it comes to leveraging the power of partnerships, one notable and important example is our RD Fund. The RD Fund was established in 2018 to serve the mission of the Foundation Fighting Blindness to rapidly drive research towards preventions, treatments, and cures for the entire spectrum of retinal degenerative diseases. The initial creation of the RD Fund was made possible by an, another essential partnership with the donors who contributed to the Gordon and Lily Gunn Family Challenge. It's part of our strategy for adapting to a rapidly changing environment with many more academic research projects that are really becoming ready for translation into clinical testing and commercialization. But running clinical trials is expensive and complicated. So in order to spread the investment and risk, the RD Fund approach is, to, is based on leveraging our funding with other investment firms and strategic partners that allow us to accelerate more opportunities than we could fund on our own. It's essentially like a, a hyper accelerating effect. So I'm pleased to have on the call today my colleague, Dr. Rusty Kelly, who is our Senior Vice President of Investments and Alliances. With a strong scientific and financial background and expertise in clinical development and venture funding, Rusty joined our team three years ago to help coordinate our efforts around the RD Fund. Rusty has been instrumental in driving the success of the RD Fund and the critical role we are playing in helping get more potential treatments and cures to our community. Today, he's going to provide a snapshot of the fund's portfolio companies and our next steps to leverage the momentum we've created. So Rusty, please go ahead. Thank you, Ben. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to provide you with an update on the activities of the RD Fund and our portfolio companies. As Ben described, the RD Fund serves a key role in bringing donors and innovators together. In simple terms, the RD Fund uses a venture philanthropy model that brings to bear financial resources, the resources of the foundation, and surrounds itself with like-minded investment firms to select and support promising companies and technologies. Venture philanthropy is a type of an impact investment that takes concepts and techniques from venture capital finance and business management and applies them to achieving philanthropic goals. In our case, via mission-related investments that aim to provide both clinical and financial returns to the foundation. This approach leverages the breadth and depth of the foundation's knowledge, global relationships and resources, including those that Ben mentioned earlier, the Clinical Consortium, My Retinal Tracker Registry, our Scientific Advisory Board, and outside funding from co-investment partners. Let me share with you a few points on how the fund works. We focus primarily on companies with programs that are in clinical testing or can be in the clinic in less than 18 to 24 months. We use a variety of investment strategies, including convertible debt, equity, royalties, and or project-based co-funding. Our initial investment allocation range or check size is typically between two and five million with appropriate reserves to provide each company additional funding as needed. Importantly, all proceeds that the RD Fund receives back over time from these investments are returned to the foundation to provide resources to further our mission. For example, the fund would receive returns or funds back when a portfolio company is sold or becomes publicly traded. The RD Fund has an independent board of directors with representatives uh, from the Foundation Fighting Blindness and other experienced community members who bring significant scientific, clinical, and financial expertise to the team. We are very fortunate to have an experienced investment executive, Warren Thaler, as, the, as our RD Fund board chair. Warren is a longtime key, key supporter of the Foundation and has served as the Foundation board member for many years. Warren is joined on the RD Fund board by David Brent, Chairman of the Foundation, Jackie, Dr. Jackie Duncan, UCSF Ophthalmologist and Chair of the Foundation Scientific Advisory Board, Dr. Jonathan Steinberg, Chair of the Foundation, Foundation's Research Oversight Committee, Dr. Adrian Graves, former CEO of Santon, Kelly Lisbachen, Manager Director and Head of Biopharma Investment Banking at Wedbush Pat Grau, Dr. Jean Dewan, Vice Chair of Foresight Labs, Serial Inventor, Entrepreneur, and Ophthalmologist. 
And very importantly, one of the foundation's founders and the RD Fund's anchor donor, Gordon Gunn, is an honorary and active board member. The RD Fund has invested globally in, in multiple companies, including uh, internally conceived startups working on a range of promising technologies and therapeutic targets, including gene therapy, RNA therapies, pharmacotherapy or neuroprotection, optogenetics, and digital technologies. We have made 10 investments to date in the following companies. Atsina Therapeutics, Checked Up, Lookout Therapeutics, Nacuity, Nyan Therapeutics, Procure, Sparing Vision, Stargazer Pharmaceuticals, Videre, and now Videre Bio 2. The 10 investments total nearly 43 million in currently committed capital and with approximately 23 million in capital reserves for the existing portfolio. We now have committed 90% of our uh, initial 72 million under management for the fund. The RD Fund continues to partner with a growing and impressive list of top tier venture firms and strategic partners, such as Atlas Venture, RA Capital, Abingworth, Hatteras Venture Partners, Paul B. Manning Capital, and Novartis, just to name a few. To date, outside investors have committed over 235 million towards the RD Fund portfolio companies. This outside capital represents well over five-fold additional investment dollars alongside the RD Fund. There are four companies in our portfolio conducting clinical trials that are currently enrolling patients at Sigma Therapeutics, Nacuity, Procure, and Stargazer. So I'll provide a brief overview of, of each of these companies. Atsina Therapeutics is a clinically staged gene therapy company focused on bringing life-changing power of genetic medicine to reverse or prevent blindness. Atsina is developing novel gene therapies, including a phase 1-2 clinical program for Lieber, Lieber congenital amaurosis, LCA1, based on the research from Dr. Shannon Boyd's lab at the University of Florida. Atsina has raised 8.15 million series seed funding led by the RD Fund and Hatteras Venture Partners. And they just completed a 55 million Series A financing led by Sofanova Partners with participation from Abingworth and Lightstone Ventures alongside existing investors. Atsina is currently enrolling the second cohort of its LCA1 Phase 1-2 trial. Nacuity is a clinical stage pharmaceutical company working on a breakthrough treatment for RP by addressing oxidative stress in the retina, which causes cell degeneration and vision loss in virtually all forms of RP. Nacuity's approach using N-acetylcysteine amide, or NACA as we refer to it, with its anti-oxidative -oxid properties may benefit people with RP regardless of the gene mutation causing their disease. This approach is based on studies from the laboratory of Dr. Peter Campachera at the Wilmer Eye Institute work that was partially funded by the foundation. Nucuity has completed preclinical toxicology programs and filed an IND or an investigational new drug application with the US FDA. They completed a phase one clinical trial in healthy volunteers in Australia in 2019 and initiated the, a phase one, two trial in Australia in 2020 focused on the treatment of RP in patients with Usher syndrome. Nacuity expects to report on the first round of safety data from the ongoing phase two trial by Q4 of 2021 and report efficacy data by mid to late 2022. Procure is a clinical staged company developing transformative RNA repair platform therapies for the treatment of severe genetic rare diseases, such as Libra congenital amaurosis, LCA10, Usher syndrome, and other forms of retinitis pigmentosa. Procure has announced positive findings from a planned three-month interim analysis of its phase 1-2 stellar trial of QR421A in adults with Usher syndrome and non-syndromic retinitis pigmentosa due to USH2A exon 13 mutations, a program also co-funded by the RD Fund. They plan to complete enrollment in the stellar phase 1-2 clinical trial of QR421 at the end of 2021 and report on the phase 1-2 interim analysis in the first half of 2022. Stargazer Pharmaceuticals is a biopharmaceutical company developing treatments for rare eye diseases. Their lead candidate, STG001, an oral non-retinoid visual cycle modulator to treat Stargardt disease is designed, designed to reduce blood concentrations of RBP4, a protein that delivers vitamin A to the retina. 
By reducing the uptake of vitamin A in the retina, researchers believe this approach can potentially reduce the accumulation of retinal toxins for people with Stargardt disease and prevent retinal degeneration and subsequent vision loss. Stargazers completed a phase one safety trial in Australia um, of their lead compound and healthy volunteers, and they are currently enrolling a phase 2A clinical trial in Stargardt disease patients. They recently completed a 57 million Series A financing. This was in the spring of 2020 with lead investors Novo Ventures, Venbio Partners, Canaan Partners, and Pontifax Venture Capital. They are targeting completion of the Phase 2A trial in early 2021 and expect to initiate a Phase 2B3 trial in the middle of 20, uh, 2021. This level of clinical activity is truly exciting and indicates the near-term potential of research that the foundation has been funding, in some cases for many years. Now, moving on to the other portfolio companies, I'll provide a brief summary of each company's focus. Checked Up is a healthcare technology company that deploys a state-of-the-art platform into specialty healthcare facilities, including eye care practices across the U.S. to actively engage patients, caregivers, and physicians in the waiting room, exam room, and potentially at home. The company recently launched a new telemedicine platform during the COVID-19 pandemic and is the only 100% digital push technology platform designed for specialty point of care. Lookout Therapeutics is a new RD fund portfolio company founded with a leading venture capital group and with significant expertise in both gene therapy and rare diseases. Lookout is working to bring in promising technologies in the IRD and or dry MD space. Nyan Therapeutics is a preclinical stage company developing mutation agnostic therapies to, tr to treat inherited retinal diseases. Nine is developing novel small molecules that preserve cone function by downregulating rod specific genes, thereby potentially preserving color and central vision in patients with inherited retinal diseases. The company was founded based on the research of Dr. Tom Ray's lab at the University of Washington, also partially funded by the foundation. Sparing Vision is a biotechnology company focused on the discovery and development of innovative therapies for the treatment of blinding inherited retinal diseases. The Sparing Vision is developing a gene-independent treatment for retinitis pigmentosa, the most common, in, common inherited retinal disease. SPVN06, their lead, is designed to prevent the degeneration of cone photoreceptors leading to blindness. And last but not least, Fideri Bio, a Cambridge, Massachusetts-based biotech company, is focused on next-generation optogenetic gene therapy as an approach to restore vision in patients that have lost most vision due to degeneration of photoreceptors. This technology has the potential to work regardless of the genetic cause of the disease and works by introducing a light responsive gene into cells that do not normally respond to light, making them light sensitive. Fideri Bio was founded based on the work primarily from the labs of Dr. John Flannery and Dr. Udi Isakoff of the University of California, Berkeley and technology from the University of Pennsylvania. Bideri Bio was launched in June 2019 with a 21 million equity financing round led by Atlas Venture, of which the RD Fund contributed 3 million. Bideri's advanced technology caught the attention of industry leaders, and in October of 2020, the company announced its acquisition by Novartis for 150 million upfront. Including future potential milestone payments, the total deal was valued at approximately 280 million effectively achieving a return of investment of over fourfold with the upfront return and potentially greater than sevenfold pending near-term payments from milestone achievements. Bideri's bio, uh, Bideri Bio's acquisition by Novartis validates the power of the venture philanthropy model that we spoke of earlier for accelerating our mission while providing for meaningful returns to support the foundation's mission. Importantly, Novartis plans to invest significant resources to bring this technology into the clinic and if successful, ultimately to patients in need. An additional benefit of this transaction is that the RD Fund also invested in the same Videri team along with the same investors to, perform, to form Videri Bio 2, a spin out of Videri Bio, which is working on next generation gene therapies for retinal degenerative diseases. So based on the success and impact of RD Fund 1, we have launched fundraising efforts for RD Fund 2. 
Our aim is to build on the diversity of the overall portfolio, including novel strategies based on modality, time of intervention, gene-specific and gene-agnostic approaches to potentially help address as many of the over 300 identified inherited retinal diseases as possible. Although the RD Fund 2 will primarily focus on therapeutics, we'll also consider supporting technologies such as device, large and small molecule delivery, diagnostics, telemedicine, and healthcare IT that further advance the foundation's mission. Active fundraising is underway for major gift donations for RD Fund 2, which already includes a generous gift of 15 million anchor donation from the Manning Family Foundation. We look forward to updating you on these efforts. We have just published our first RD Fund Outlooks and Outcomes report, which provides detailed non-confidential information about the fund and our portfolio companies. You can find this report and additional information about the RD Fund at our website, rdfund.org. In summary, the RD Fund is a critical part of the foundation's effort to deliver life-changing solutions for individuals with retinal degenerative diseases today, while also creating a pipeline of next generation and novel therapeutic opportunities for tomorrow. We are very grateful to our donors, investment partners, and innovative portfolio companies for creating opportunities that can make a difference for our community. Thank you for your attention. And now I'll turn this call back over to Jason. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rusty, for that great update. And I think on behalf of everyone on the audience, I can truly say it is just awesome to see the progress that we're making, not just through our preclinical and grants and awards, but really through the RD Fund and the clinical stage programs that are being supported uh, by it. So um, we look forward to many more updates and uh, new news on the RD Fund side in the, uh, the weeks, months, and years ahead. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to open up the call to take your questions. It is um, 1.37 here on the East Coast. We have about 20 minutes for q and I'm going to ask all of our um, panel to turn their cameras and their um, mics back on so we can direct questions to each of you. And now I'm going to ask for Chris to review the instructions on how to ask your question as well. Thanks, Jason. As a reminder, there are several methods for asking questions. First, you may access the Q&A and chat features located at the bottom of your Zoom control bar and type in your questions. And that's if you are on desktop or computer. Um, if you are on tablets, feel free to tap the screen or swipe to get to those features. Second, you can ask questions verbally. To do so, please select the hand raising function on the menu bar at the bottom of the Zoom interface and we will provide you with the instructions to unmute yourself. And third, if you've joined by phone for today's call, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Pressing star six will mute and unmute your line. You may also submit questions via email at info at fightingblindness.org. Again, that's info at fightingblindness.org. Please note that if there are questions that we aren't able to answer today, Due to time constraints, we will follow up with you directly via email over the next week or two. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. And we do have a few questions that have already been chatted in. And uh, the first I'm going to direct to Amy Laster. Um, Amy, we have two questions um, regarding particular areas of the IRD landscape that folks are curious about, um, whether there are any research updates that we can share. The first is Bartle Beetle syndrome. And um, the second is uh, a type of LCA, uh, NMNAT1. So maybe I could ask you to address any updates you're familiar with on those two areas of the IRD landscape. Sure, Jason, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, to address the, the Barton Beetle syndrome, um, which is a complex disorder that affects many parts of the body, including the retina, and typically individuals with this syndrome um, will have a retinal degeneration that's very similar to retinitis pigmentosa. Um, right now, we do know that there are researchers at the University of Iowa um, that have been establishing a preclinical gene therapy program uh, for two forms of Barnet Beetle syndrome. These studies, they're still in animals, but they are advancing towards uh, translating their studies for human clinical trials. Um, with regards to LCA that's due to mutations in the NMNAT1 gene, um, this is a common cause of LCA. It accounts for about 5% of the cases. It's an early onset recessive 
disease. Um, the gene is relatively small. So this makes it an attractive candidate for gene augmentation therapy. Uh, there are researchers currently um, at the mass eye and ear who's developing a AAV mediated gene augmentation therapy um, as a potential treatment. So these studies um, are also being you know, tested in animals and the recent data uh, from a subretinal injection using AAV that carries the normal copy of the NMNAT1. Um, it rescued retinal structure and function. So this is data that's very important as a first step to demonstrate proof of concept for therapy to treat patients uh, with this form of LCA. There's also some other preclinical research that's going on that focus on how the protein that's encoded uh, by this gene works. And this is to allow researchers to really identify other targets as potential treatment strategies in order to, to treat this form of disease. I mean, toward the question of the gene therapy treatment for LCA that's out now, the Luxterna, um, that's very specific for mutations due to RPE65. Um, so it would only be effective for individuals with mutations for RPE65 and not for uh, patients that have NMNA T1 mutation. Very good, thank you so much, Amy. And I, I should have actually uh, taken the opportunity to introduce you because I don't know that our audience has, has met you before. Dr. Amy Laster is our Vice President of uh, Science in our awards program and she oversees all the many award programs and funding of the researchers across the globe that, we, um, that we're so proud to work with. And, uh, we're very happy to have her join us on this Insight Forum, and thank you very much, Amy, for that question. We'll probably have some more questions for you as the uh, as the Q and A session continues. Um, the The next question there was a, a question about pronunciation of the dairy, and Rusty, I'll, I'll tackle that. It's V is in Victor, E D is in David, E R E the dairy bio, and so uh, wanted to make sure that we uh, answer that question. Um, a great uh, sort of uh, aspirational question, I'm gonna to direct to you, Ben, um, which is what projects are you most excited about in 2021? And um, there's obviously a lot that we do between the RD Fund, My Retina Tracker, all our grants and awards, all the companies that are spinning out. So there's a lot of different things to be excited about, but as the CEO, what is the, the one project or, or um, initiative you're most excited about? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question and a tough one, because um, I think there is so much to be excited about. Um, but I think high on my list, frankly, is optogenetics, um, because I think that when you look at the uh, project developed by Videri and then uh, acquired by Novartis, it just has tremendous potential to help a wide variety of, of people suffering from late stage disease. And the data just looks really, really good. And um, when you see data like that, that doesn't just look good to people who are in the field, but people who are looking for breakthrough therapeutics uh, and are willing to put that kind of money down on something, it, it's really validating um, to, to the power of this kind of therapy. So I think that's certainly high on my list. And then, you know, after that, it's, there are just so many exciting programs where clinical data is starting to be generated. And I think any program where there's... Uh, you know, really good animal data uh, for gene augmentation and a solid therapy in the clinic, you know, just stay tuned for these results because they're going to start coming in rapidly in the next one to two years. You know, Ben, let me follow up with that. There's a question about optogenetics specifically. I recognize that um, at this point, the, the work in optogenetics are, are preclinical, but the question is, do we have any sense what type of vision a patient might expect from optogenetics when it makes it to the clinic and into people? Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to make these predictions, but we do know uh, at the level of uh, the animal models where going into a, essentially a blind mouse, a mouse with no photoreceptors, they've been able to restore visual acuity to the level of uh, a fraction of a centimeter. So it's not perfect and it's unknown about the speed of the light detection in terms of maybe a blurring effect um, that may require some more optimization, but these animals have been able to see um, 
moving lines that are quite narrow uh, with good contrast sensitivity and recognize objects in a dim room. But again, these are animal studies. These are mice that can't tell us how they're seeing. <laughs> we just uh, analyze their behavior, but it's some of the strongest data we've ever seen in the field. So we're encouraged. Thank you. Um, and again, a reminder, you can ask questions through a variety of different ways. Um, we have a, a couple questions that have come in about my retina tracker. And um, it may be a good time, Todd, uh, to just give a, a brief overview or I guess update on my retina tracker, but also um, there's a very specific question that we get often and someone chatted it in here today, which is, you know, any updates or any feedback that you can provide when a uh, genetic test comes back with an inclusive, um, an inconclusive finding. Okay. Um, so we are uh, up to over 16,000 members in our registry right now, my retina tracker registry, and over half of these have genetic testing results in their profile. So we're very pleased with the growth of this program. Uh, just as a reminder, the purpose of this program is to enable researchers to contact uh, uh, relevant in individuals for research studies, whether these are clinical trials, natural history studies, patient journey studies. And we are satisfying requests quite a bit for researchers in the, in the community. So I encourage all of our members to keep their profiles up to date. We do use your profiles to help identify and match you with research opportunities. And I also want to say that we have a number of um, opportunities that where we approach all of our membership uh, to contribute information, such as the study we did last year with Retin International on the cost of illness. So please do keep your eyes out for opportunities like that. Your voice really does matter. As to the second question, Jason, this is a challenging area in genetics. Um, what, I just had a conversation with one of our genetic counselor this week about this very question. You know, the best advice is if you have family members who can get tested, this can shed light on your own particular gene mutation. And this information does, um, it is modified quite, quite a bit. So this really points to the importance of our mission, really to understand genetic causes of disease, but it's also very scientifically challenged. And I'm sure for those who have inconclusive results, it can be very frustrating. Excellent. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, there was a, a follow-on question about genetic testing um, that, uh, that was chatted in about intronic gene testing. And I don't know if you have any uh, information you want to share on that, or maybe we can follow up that question offline. Yeah, let's follow up later. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we had a question chatted in about um, the CRB1 gene. And Rusty, I know that obviously as part of the RD fund, you not only um, have a good handle on the landscape with the portfolio companies, but also just all sorts of activity that are happening in research. And you're, you're very familiar with the CRB1 landscape. So maybe you can share an update on, uh, on that landscape. Yeah, C CRB1 is an indication that we are um, paying very close attention to. And this primarily comes from the fact that the foundation has funded work both in Europe and in the US, Leiden University and Duke University for, for several years now. Uh, the, the genetics is still being worked out for, for this disease. There, there are multiple uh, transcripts involved, uh, but I think um, we're gonna make significant pro progress here shortly, given that these research-based studies in academia are now moving uh, towards industry. Um, so there is not an actively um, enrolling clinical trial yet, but, but stay, stay tuned. Excellent. Thank you, Rusty. Um, we have, uh, like we always do, we have many questions about specific genes like we just had for CRB1. And I'll, I'll use this opportunity to remind everyone that at our website, which is fightingblindness.org, uh, we've got a, a great amount of resources, not just about the programs that are happening, um, preclinical through our grants and awards programs that we fund, but also there's a terrific pipeline of programs that are in clinic or approaching clinic. And uh, it's a terrific resource to, to be able to, to go to, to understand more about what's happening in the field. Um, and also we always encourage folks to uh, go to clintrials.gov, which also has the listing of, of any clinical trial happening in our space. Um, there's a question about uh, if there's a way to donate money specifically to a, a particular study or a particular trial or a particular gene, or sometimes we get questions about a particular researcher. 
And, um, you know, as a nonprofit, we have to be really careful in terms of how we um, take what are called restricted donations. And so we have a set of, of policies and guidelines that we follow. And what I would encourage folks to, um, to, to learn more about that is if you have a question, if you have an interest in a, a very specific area of research, um, and oftentimes this happens at the gene level, um, to, to send a note to info at fightingblindness.org. I will say that the restrictions that we put in place around the level of giving for a, a gene-specific or gene-restricted donation is quite large. It's actually $300,000 or greater. Um, but if that is of something of interest and you have um, the desire to learn more, I, I really do encourage you to reach out and we can have a conversation. But that question does come up from time to time. Um, the next question I was going to ask is directed to Amy. Um, there's a question about a chromatopsia. And uh, the question is, I read, I read that AGTC has had success with the chromatopsia. And the question is, is this a gene uh, genetic editing uh, program or is it a therapeutic and maybe anything you can share about the AGTC a chromatopsia program? Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. So AGTC is a gene therapy uh, company. And so their strategy for a chromatopsia uh, two forms of it, the A3 and B3, are gene therapy uh, strategies. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Laster. Um, we've got about eight minutes left, so I'll, um, I'll make sure that we try to get as many questions in as we can, although I will remind everyone that anytime you have a question that has been chatted in to the Insights Forum or asked on Facebook or email or raised your hand or any of the ways that we take questions. If there's a question we don't get to, we always take a list and we always follow up with everyone um, offline. And uh, there's a question which I think, again, comes up from time to time, which is, how do I know what form of RP I have? And this is a great reminder to, to the importance of genetic testing and our um, genetic testing program. And so, Todd, maybe you could just quickly review how that genetic testing program works for people that have not been genetically tested and want to understand what their gene is, um, you could perhaps review that. Right. For the uh, last year or so, we have had an open access genetic testing program, which comes at no cost um, to you. Uh, it needs There's information on our website and the website of Blueprint Genetics about this program. Um, you will need to approach a healthcare practitioner who can order a diagnostic test for you and they will uh, order the test through the Blueprint uh, ordering portal, which is called Nucleus. Uh, and then uh, Blueprint will send a, a test kit to you to collect a DNA sample, uh, typically that saliva, and you send that off and you'll um, be counseled by the genetic counselor once your results are returned. Uh, and hopefully that result would be uh, clear and conclusive for you, but the genetic counselor and your um, healthcare practitioner or ophthalmologist would really give you guidance from that point. But that testing program is available to you uh, at no cost. Excellent. Thank you very much, Todd. Um, ben, I'm gonna direct these next couple questions to you. Um, there's a, a number of questions, and I think it may be from the same, uh, same participant, but they're, a common question that we get, which is about clinical development and you know, things like what percentage of trials that come out of the translational phase actually make it into an IND and phase one clinical testing. And you know, what's the time frame from the time that someone, a program goes from phase one testing all the way through to an approved therapy. And I think for our audience, really what they're getting at is setting expectations, all this great work that we're hearing about preclinical, what does the roadmap look like from that point to the time that they actually end up in the market? Sure, I can attempt to do it. It's gonna be general, but um, I think that, you know, in our space, if you have something, you know, if you have a preclinical candidate, it looks like it's ready for development. It typically takes 18 to 24 months to get through the pre-IND work and get something ready to, you know, do the first human testing. And then from there, it can take you know, anywhere from six to 10 years to get to final approval. Um, even if these trials are small in a rare disease space, it does take time to recruit and the FDA requires long-term safety follow-up and lots of other stuff that's required for final approval. So I think those are some general, general guidelines. Um, probability of success and failure rates are a little harder to get, you know, get a handle on, but I think that, and it's gonna sound 
terrible, but when you're at the preclinical stage, typically your probability of success is about 10%. And then it goes up dramatically as you get into the clinic and get clinical data from there. But even if you have positive phase three results, your probability of being approved is still probably 90% or something like that, because you never know what the FDA is going to do. So you have to keep all these things in mind. And what we do at the foundation is to try to de-risk programs to try to optimize their probability of success and to speed up their trajectory in the way that they get tested. So um, that's, that's kind of something we study. There's actually a recent publication uh, that reviewed all gene therapy programs in the clinic and showed that, if I got this right, Peter, you can correct me, that in ophthalmology, uh, as the therapeutic area, had one of the highest probabilities of success in moving from one stage to another. So that's actually good for us. That, that's right, Ben. The, um, what, what the study showed, and if you'd like to review the study in full, it's uh, Nature Reviews Drug Discovery is the name of the publication. And this was uh, published just uh, this week, January 25th of 2021. So hot off the press has been. Um, but so uh, what this study showed, uh, this was a review of all the clinical studies and they showed that the uh, likelihood of success for a, a therapeutic a gene therapy that just entered the clinic, it was 31% in the ophthalmology field, which is pretty good and, and higher than you would expect for a standard uh, treatment entering clinical trials. So that's good. But you know, as Ben noted, these studies can take, can range from, from getting into clinical trials, human clinical trials to reaching the market can be three years on the short end, but it can be 10 plus years on the long end. So it's very difficult to assess the timing at that early stage of development. Very good. Um, thank you very much, Peter and Ben. Um, we've probably got time for maybe one more question. And I, I, I see a familiar name that chatted in a, a question, Jack Newdell, and uh, very happy to uh, have his question answered. Um, the question is about um, a, a company called Averic Bio. And they had a, Jack had a very specific question about any updates that we can provide um, specific to the best disease program that Averic um, had licensed um, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, and also whether there's anything else that we can share specific to best disease. And so I'm not sure, you know, Rusty, are you, are you best to answer that question? Probably not. I, I do okay. not know the status of, of that trial, but it, I think Iveric would, you know, would, would reveal that on their webpage if, if you haven't already checked. Um, actually, Peter, um, do you have some information on, on that? And this is just from Iveric's uh, own, own website. It's a program that, um, that we've been tracking because there is um, so little available uh, to patients with BEST. Uh, but uh, they do plan to initiate, um, according to their most recent press release, a um, study in this setting uh, in the, looks like second half of 2021, so later this year. Again, this would be a phase one, two clinical trials for so the earliest stage of clinical trials. It would be likely a very small study, um, but uh, we, we look forward to that study starting and moving forward. Uh, as far as uh, I'm aware, uh, is it would be the first uh, gene therapy into human trials for in this indication. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, it is just about two o'clock here on the East Coast, so we're gonna wrap things up. Um, but as I mentioned a little bit ago, that we always capture all the questions that are asked via Facebook, via email, via hands that are raised and chat and <laughs> Q&A in the Zoom interface. And uh, our team follows up with every single question that we didn't get to live. And so be, a look, be on the lookout if you did ask a question that we didn't get to that we will follow up with you in the weeks ahead. And I do want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for participating in today's call. Um, as a reminder, there will be a transcript and audio recording of the call on our website within the next week. And if there's any information you need or any questions we can answer, our website, fightingblindness.org, is a great resource. And of course, you can always reach out to us directly by sending us an email to info at fightingblindness.org. So thank you, everyone, for your time today and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.